Holy Alfred centric. Ah. Wow. Sorry. Take two. Holy Alfred centric episode Batman. Tiki here and I'm watching through Batman the animated series for the first time. And oh man, I'm getting a I'm getting a great Alfred episode. He's off with his friend. He's in London. There's shenanigans. There's a uh, there's even thugs named Bert and Ernie. Good times, but oh no, oh no, it's Red Claw Dragon. You gotta help me out, buddy. Tell him why. See, folks, long ago I made a vow about Edge K Tiki in the ways of Batman the Animated Series, serving as his spirit guide to Gotham, in a way. And tonight, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 21, The Lion and the Unicorn. So, Dragon, yeah, as I alluded to in that intro, um, I was very much enjoying this episode, and then I saw Zatanna, or, God, I'm sorry, not Zatanna, Jesus, I'm sorry, Red Claw, I saw Red Claw, I got very worried because you know uh, the last time we saw Red Claw that that didn't that, that well. did not go well. Yeah, didn't go well. Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> so, Dragon, you'll be happy to know that uh, in spite of my worry, I thought this was a damn good episode, man. Yeah. So here's the thing: these episodes are kind of like the reason why I'm interested in doing animated Batcave. For me, it's not even episodes like, you know, don't get me wrong, Baby Doll was great, but Baby Doll, you know, I, I'd pretty much known the beats of Baby Doll for a while now. It's such a landmark episode, it's kind of like, you know, sort of in the pop culture zeitgeist, if you will. But an episode like this, I mean, it's never going to make a top ten list, you know, and I acknowledge it's not an episode that's really made to make any sort of top ten list. Dragon, this episode is just fun with a capital F. And not only is it fun, but it's got a Hitchcock level of suspense to it. A Hitchcock level, sorry. Hitchcockian level of suspense, yes. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I think this might be one of the most underrated uh, finales of any episode that I've ever seen of Batman. I mean, the uh, like everything from from when the bomb goes off onward, I'm just like so on the edge of my seat. It's not even funny. Like I. I love those last couple minutes. <laughs> All right. Let's just say I had some, if we were doing reaction videos to it, uh, there's two moments in particular that I would have, like, you know, a, a visible, like, entertaining reaction to at the very end, but we'll get to them. I'll build them up. All right. All right. So, uh, go ahead, Dragon. What's your, uh, what's your thoughts and background? And also, Dragon, I'm curious, you know, because this is one of the uh, one of the other reasons I like doing Batcave. I'm curious what your uh, what the overall thoughts from the fandom is on this episode. Well, this is very much this unfairly kind of gets lost in the shuffle. As again, it's a lot of season I kind three of as a whole that. kind of gets lost in the shuffle because again, everybody's going to season two because of you know your Harley and Ivies and the, your, your almost Gotham's and you know and, and right. perchance the dreams. Which, again, all fantastic episodes, all phenomenal. Again, that's kind of where the animated series kind of hits, like, the mega, kind of the, again, kind of the, the mega saturation, in, in a good way. And that's where everyone kind of, the name is recognized for the artistry of season one, season two goes down in history, and then season three continues. But it continues with good <laughs> stuff. It's, it's good stuff that's continuing, though. That's what, okay, my point is. Um, so season three is the Donkey Kong Country three of the Batman, the animated series seasons. A lot of the, it's a lot of the, it's the lost gold, as it were. And there's a lot of golden season <laughs> right, three, but right. it gets, over, it gets overlooked. The big standout for season three being Baby Doll and the introduction of Rachel. Those are kind of the big, those are the big uh, the standouts of season three as a whole. <laughs> so um, very simply, I mean, this is like, Everyone always cites the Forgotten as like the big oh yeah it's a, it's an Alfred it's an Alfred centric episode in which we see Alfred you know, in the field and doing stuff on behalf of Batman we're like yeah but I mean we literally have an Alfred centric episode in this, season three yeah this everyone, is very yeah. much an Alfred episode yeah more so than saying, the Forgotten for years everyone because again season one and two were on the mind they always forget about three and it's like come on guys and it's like that's so there's also a reverse of that once we get to one other in season three it's kind of like they're remembering this before they're remembering Fantastic. As it always bothers me. We'll get there. All right. Well, you know what, Dragon? It's gonna. I'm gonna make it my mission. You know, of course, we don't want to record too long, but I'm gonna make right. it my mission 
for uh, this podcast, man. I want some love for this episode, dude. I really do. I want I want to shine a light on this episode because I think this episode has a lot going for it. Is it perfect? No. And like I said, I don't even think it's the kind of episode that's written to like you know be a pantheon episode, if it if you will. But honestly, Dragon, I feel like I'm not saying this in a bad way at all. I feel like this episode is a really fun kind of like B-movie spy thriller in the Batman the Animated Series canon. Mm -hmm. And I say that in the best way possible. So, uh, okay. let me let me give a little bit of context here. Not a whole lot. Just gonna just gonna get through it here. So, uh, the director on this, Boyd Kirkland, the great Boyd Kirkland, who'd done uh, again the Forgotten. How appropriate again the first time Alfred's kind of uh, getting in the field and doing stuff. So appropriate it goes to him. Um, Terror in the Sky is also him. I, I mentioned that for, for a reason once we get to our writers here. So the writers, uh, we had the, a writing duo, I believe a husband and wife duo, Diane uh, Duane and uh, Peter Morewood, who uh, wrote on Gargoyles and the Spider-Man Unlimited series. The not-so-great follow-up to the 90s Spider-Man series. But <laughs> point being, they had Gargoyles, which is fantastic. And seriously, folks, watch Gargoyles. It's on Disney+. Plus. Bask in it. So uh, the other the other writer, the big uh, big kind of standout to me, Steve Perry. We've covered Steve Perry stuff before. Because Steve Perry, he is kind of the, the go to sequel guy, and kind of the off the beaten path guy. Like he did the the Ninja, Night of the Ninja, and Day of the Samurai. He did those two. Uh, he did Terror in the Sky, of course, follow up to the Man Bat episode. Did Time Out of Joints. So you get a sense he's very much kind of the sequel guy. So they kind of uh, kind of melded our writers uh, for this one. Uh, probably maybe brought in some additional help on this one. I'm not sure. Um, studio worked on this. Dong Yang, of course, they've done oh, again. Yeah. Let me give you two Alfred-related ones off the bat. Uh, Dong Yang did uh, Eternal Youth, again another Alfred-centric one, and uh, The Forgotten. Oh man, Eternal Youth is like kind of like that's the one that should be forgotten out of yeah. all the Alfred-centric episodes. Dragon, that's the yeah. one where it's like I don't care if I ever watch that one again. But again, I do like it's that. It's got know, some. It, it's got some fun stuff in it. Don't get me wrong, you know, I, I mean, we always use the, uh, you know, the diamond analogy with this show, you know, it's like there's there's a couple inherently bad episodes, but few and far between. Sure, sure, and again, I do I do really like Eternal Youth for the Alfred stuff, like, fence, you know, kind of sense, you know, kind of having Alfred as kind of our lead character for an act, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see, okay, uh, so of course, uh, the big thing to note here, this is really important for this episode, is uh, there... This episode is the first time we've kind of adapted Alfred's backstory uh, in you know animation, and just kind of honestly adapted it. Period, because we Alfred had I won't bore you with all the details. You know, there's like pre crisis and post crisis. They're all they're like different versions of Alfred and of Alfred's history in the comics, and basically the animated series blended the the two main ones together in a really smart way. Because uh, you know back in the old days, you had like a hint that Alfred was a spy and had like MI6 like kind of stuff in his background. So that's kind of that's mainly where this comes from, but also they didn't go too heavy into it. Where, you know, they didn't they didn't they didn't outright say he's he was in MI six in this episode or that he was like you know a soldier in, in you know in the in the, you know, the British Army so to speak, but he was uh, so again they kind of made made him like an intelligence agent. So they did a really good kind of um, good blend there. I felt so big. The big reason I bring it up is because this is like paves the way for years later when we we really lean heavy into like you know, Alfred's you know experiences in the past and his wartime stuff and like how he's a field medic and everything and uh, Gotham and then of course Pennyworth and Earth One. You don't get any of these like major like Alfred backstory stuff. Wait, wait, of... wait! Hold on. Is Pennyworth actually a thing? Well, what do you mean? I mean, did it actually come out? Yeah, it's in, going hey. in the season two. Oh my! Oh my God! Wow. Pennyworth felt like a fever dream of a concept that it, I didn't it know. It is. Don't get me wrong. I watched the first season. It's really, like, it's not, it's not super necessary. It's not, wow. it's not terrible. It's not necessary. You know, it's... Dragon, I'm not even kidding you, man. It's like I heard about Pennyworth, like, once, and I was like, oh, that sounds like some silly idea that'll never get made. <laughs> okay, season two. Oh, God. Okay. Well, that that just crushes my reality a little bit. I mean, yeah. I, ho I hope them the best, but anyways, but go you see, ahead. You see my point. They're kind of, uh, they're, they're, you kind of paved the way for the backstory stuff. Well, let's stick with, like, you know, let's stick with uh, Gotham. Gotham was a good Alfred. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, you get Gotham thanks to that Earth-1 Batman story, which, again, Earth-1 Batman's definitely making a comeback with the Batman stuff we're getting these days. <laughs> I'll say sure. that. Sure. So oh, like yeah. doing kind of like the more rough and tough Alfred, like you know, the, you know, he was, used to be a soldier and that sort of stuff, and 
uh, so yeah, we kind of we he always started off as a field medic, and then over the years it kind of became he's more gruff and tumble, and he was a soldier back in the day. And again, that's made a resurgence in pop culture with Gotham, and then of course we lean too heavy into it with Pennyworth. But anyway, <laughs> um, one last note: uh, Batman sixty six. Of course, Batman sixty six very famously uh, they did a they did a, a three parter set in London, but they couldn't say London. They they had they went to Londinium. It's called Londinium Larceny. Oh dear God! Oh man! That's fucking sixty six Batman. Jesus! All right. That's what I'm saying. It's a little fun fact. So that's like one of the most notable <laughs> times Batman has like left Gotham and gone to London. So it's just kind of like maybe I don't, they're not adapting it per se. But again, if you want to look at the animated series, sometimes they adapt a more serious version of the sixties concepts. Batman goes to London. Let's do it like a spy thriller. Cool. You know. And you know what? That's one other thing I want to bring up in kind of my thesis of sorts with this episode. Is that when I found out it was a Batman going to London episode, I got nervous because, Dragon, as you know, I think collectively you and I, when we see Batman outside of Gotham in this series, it's always, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a coin flip on how good it's yep. going to be. Unless it's really but, uh, cool, it's not, it's not a guarantee. But with this, I feel like it works incredibly well just because of the atmosphere of London. And I think London as a city just, may, you know, fits the Batman aesthetic really well. And we'll kind of highlight that throughout. Okay, let's uh, dive right. right into it. Okay, so another thing. I'm sorry, I'm kind of pre-rambling here. The uh, the title card and the uh, the title itself, Dragon, I love how the title itself is like a foreshadow. And when you see the title, you're like, what the heck does that mean? Yeah, it is a good tension grab. We're like, what the lion and the unicorn and say? I, and, what? When, and, when it, and when it pays off in the actual episode, I thought I thought that was another super cool reveal. So that's what I'm saying, man. This episode's kind of working on a lot of levels in terms of the mystery and the spy thriller elements. All right, yeah. anyways, let's set us up. Okay, so we're in the Batcave, uh, but from Alfred's perspective, which, again, I love starting off an episode like that, because, again, we always got to give Alfred some love. Now, Alfred's one of the great enduring characters of all time, one of the, one of the all-time greats. So, Alfred, he's he's brushing the lint off Batman's cape, and he's, he's doting on, on Dick Grayson, so he's like, like Batman saying to him, he's like, this is a great image of Alfred chasing Batman like a lint brush. <laughs> he's like... It's good enough, Alfred. The people I deal, I deal with out there won't mind a little lint. A job worth doing and all that rot, sir. <laughs> so, of course, that's a wonderful showcase of Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He's, he's, he's wonderful. And so he tells Dick Grayson to put on a shirt, because he's basically doing his acrobatic stuff, like on the balance beams and everything, and the uh, the bars, uh, you know, like the the acrobatic stuff. He's... um. He's telling like you'll get a cold in this dank cave if you don't put on a shirt, Master Grayson. He says, "Did you hear me, sir?" And he says, "Yes, Alfred. I love this. This moment always—it's a small moment. Always got me, man. It's always this. As Batman leaves, they get the Batman and go off. Um, he sees Alfred doting on doting on uh, Dick, and I love Batman gives like the famous bat smirk, gives a little smile before he leaves, and that's just bat. It's this—it's this really lovely moment, Batman, because he has like a semblance of family that he lost coming back. Yeah, yeah, back. absolutely. It's like Absolutely. Batman building a family again. It's like these little moments, like oh man, like it's like once like ah oh, man, I love that Alfred, but also like, yeah, I'm kind of doing a little family here with the ba like the early stages of the Bat family. It's really cute. And of course, by this point, uh, I feel like Robin is pretty firmly established in the series. Of course, it's you know we're on to the new adventures of Batman and Robin days. So. Yep. All right, and of course we get this great foreshadowing line, Dragon, a little on the nose, but I like it because it's economic in terms of storytelling. Yeah. What, what would we do without you, Alfred? Yeah, we've got <laughs> supper in the oven and everything set up as, as uh, Dick's going upstairs. What would we do without you, Alfred? Oh, boy. <laughs> so, Alfred gets a mysterious phone call from his cousin, Freddy. <laughs> Frederick? <laughs> Yep, and again, he's also signaling him with the whole, he calls himself Freddy, which is a great nod, him signaling something mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a little bit of their call, so that's going to come back later in an awesome bit. So he's asking for a meeting at the usual place, again, coded message. Uh, says, I'll leave immediately, and Alfred's going to leave immediately from what he from what he's doing on, on the regular. You know it's important. So uh, we'd reveal Frederick here. Greg, and, uh, you know what this made me think of? <laughs> Reggie. Uh, no, it, it made me think, kind of, but it made me think of the, uh, the just giggle like gag with Alfred trying to sneak out of the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Anyways, go ahead, go but ahead. No, seriously, though, the Freddy as a concept, too, does ring familiar with, like, again, what we saw in Gotham when we covered it very in-depthly over the years. Uh, 
the first season we had Alfred's old wartime buddy who reminded him of the darkness that he encountered, who was Reggie. Oh. So yeah, a little, little fun nod again with the Frederick of it all. Anyway, so and of course, when I brought up like this, like Alfred had like war context back when we did Gotham. This is what I was referring to. Sure, sure. So he reveals, as we reveal, that Frederick uh, was forced to call, and he's knocked out by a mysterious woman. Mm-hmm. You can tell she's wearing it. I'm kind of surprised that it, I, I didn't get who it was on my yeah. first watch, Dragon. <laughs> oh, to be fair, yeah. Because it's, seen her it's, since literally just like, it's literally just like Red Claw just standing to the side. You just kind of see her side profile. Yep. <laughs> Lady in a red right. with like a red sleeve. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So this is a great cut, by the way, a great transition. With Alfred, he laid, like, the tea set on the on the, on the the desk, and, of course, uh, we, we zoom in on them, we zoom out to reveal the next morning. <laughs> All right, so Bruce comes in, uh, you know, gives Dick the letter. Dick's kind of complaining about, like, oh, did all the butlers go on strike or what? He's got just this frozen waffle that Alfred left on the table. <laughs> <laughs> looking for looking for breakfast. All I found was this. They're so Dick Grayson's so spoiled with the food from Alfred. I'm sure. <laughs> Just <laughs> gets a, <laughs> a waffle. He's asking, "What's up?" So, um, so again, the letter essentially reads, "Apologies for leaving so abruptly." I love how apologetic and professional Alfred mm-hmm. is in the letter. And there are some great stories in the tie-in animated series tie-in stuff where, like, they do another Alfred Alfred centric story as a comic where he's. He basically, he's prepared if Bruce Wayne's butler ever gets kidnapped, and he never wants him to have to intervene, but he's like, Alfred's prepared to deal with the situation. So again, they're very much pulling from this episode with stuff like that. A lot of fun. Anyway. So, um, apologies for um, for leaving abruptly. Learned of a personal matter with my cousin. Emphasis. Must uh, must be resolved immediately. Uh, will endeavor to return in a few days. So of course, uh, Dick's remarking, uh, "This this must be important because Alfred wouldn't leave a dirty dish if England was sinking." I know. I, I love how uh, Kevin Conroy just delivers the very grim. I know. I love it when the stakes <laughs> are involved, like you know, uh, Bruce and Alfred here. Because again, we've seen like that, and in, in one of the best parts of Eternal Youth. Say what you will. Is as as a Batman searching frantically for Alfred once he knows Alfred's in danger, like Alfred. <laughs> okay, like that. this is this is going to sound really stupid. I I hope that you can grasp the comparison here, but uh, Bruce and Alfred has a little bit of an of an Ang and Oppa vibe. Yeah, sure, I, I can, I can, I can. Just in the sense that Alfred is like the one thing from Bruce's childhood that he still has around that he's still hanging on to. Yeah, I might go a little more Zuko and Iroh, but yeah, your your points. I see your point though; it's good. <laughs> well, I'm just saying in terms of just like if if Aang ever lost Appa, which you're we right. saw we did, <laughs> we saw he did obviously very memorably, very, very harrowing. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, yes, but that's the so yeah, I love like when the stakes are amped up like that. And of course, the scene coming up is where it really gets really kind of comes back there. Okay, so we're in England with all the trimmings. We got the fog, we got the double-decker buses, we got Big Ben. It's London, man. And this is what I'm talking about, man. I mean, just look at, like, like, it's all at night for the most part, which I love. I mean, that just, that in its own just kind of makes it. Could it be just that foggy, though? Right, right. (laughs) No, you're right. Just the street lamps, the the double-decker buses, the moon, and the fog. I eat dragon. It's so atmospheric. I mean, that's one of the real things I like to highlight about this episode. It reminds me of, like, in Get Smart, where they went to London for an episode. It's like, my God, they got the whole trimmings and the fog and everything. It's it's delightful. (laughs) All right. All right. So we see a very dapper Alfred, by the way. I just want to give him some style points here, because he looks fantastic. (laughs) Sure. Alfred, Alfred's waiting for Frederick uh, in the usual place. So he's accosted by Bert and Ernie. No, not that. No, not that Bert and Ernie. Different Bert and Ernie. Bert and Dragon, Ernie. of course. I, I love that last episode we had Gilligan and the Skipper. Yep, and now we got we have Bert and Ernie. <laughs> now we have like a very exaggerated like British Bert and Ernie. Yep. I wonder if behind the scenes the writers were writing this guy, these guys to have like slight characteristics of Bert and Ernie and their dynamic. Well, one is taller than the other one, so that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. There is like there is a, like there is subtle hints of you know being similar. Anyways, go ahead. Anyway, so it's Bert and Ernie. Uh, the Alfred uh, cost by Bert and Ernie, who are basically saying that they're friends of uh, Freddy. You know, they they've been sent by Freddy to uh, to take uh, take Alfred take Alfie to Freddy. 
So Alfred is smart enough to know that uh, Frederick hates being called Freddy as much as he hates being called Alfie. So he knows that something. I just love how Alfred just instantly shuts this shit down. You know, yeah. he's just like, you know, he he sees a bad situation when he you know he knows a bad situation when he sees it. Alfred ain't no ain't no dummy, kids. Alfred, Alfred knows what's up. I mean, again, he works for the world's greatest detective. He's going to pick up a few tricks. And again, as we learned, he's got a he was a really smart guy back in the day. He was really he has he has really good instincts in the field. Uh-huh. So uh, Alfred does this really. And this is what I'm talking about. See, th- this is again before they really kind of leaned more into like he was like you know he was more hands on in the field. Is that I love that Alfred, while not physically necessarily a match for these guys he does have tricks where he uses his umbrella to trip him up and, and he flees so alfred does have moves but like not as he's, again he's not like a, a brawler necessarily like sure, there'll, sure. Be, there'll be moments in the anime series where you see if batman and bruce wins in danger alfred will spring into action man he will but again he can't do a lot but he's gonna he's gonna get he's gonna give his all so he has like these little tricks these little moves that he can do in a pinch before we, years later we go all super soldier on alfred but anyway <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so uh, where's the big A on his head? Anyway, so no, <laughs> Alfred. Uh, smart enough, okay, so Alfred, uh, he, he flees. I really can't tell if you're lying or not about Pennyworth. I would have no way of knowing. Yeah, well, he could be the world's greatest liar. <laughs> Is there a super soldier element to it, though? Super soldier, no. Howling commandos, yes. Oh man! All right. Anyways, go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway, okay. So uh, Alfred does. Uh, anyway, so of course he flees into the fog, which is really cool. Alfred gets to pull his very own bad exit. I would. Oh, adorable. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. <laughs> okay, so then he calls. I love this scene so much. He calls Batman very politely. He calls Bruce. Uh, he's uh, again just so reluctantly. He didn't want to bother him. And this is a classic Alfred. I love that we kind of do more stuff with this too. It's just like <laughs> so basically so reluctant calling, apologizing for disturbing his rest, because he knows Batman doesn't get any sleep, he's like, oh, I hate to interrupt him like this. And, and Bruce is like, just cares more about Alfred, and like, what's going on? Where yeah, is he? he like, just Alfred. brings up, he's like, Alfred, where are you? Are you alright? Yep, and he says, oh, I'm at the Yorkshire Arms in, in London. London, England? There's only one master. There's only one master. <laughs> <laughs> Even in London, he's gonna give him some sass. Some Alfred sass, man. That's great. And I guess, technically, this is like one of the few day scenes we get in London. Yeah, yeah, and again, like a night's pass, and it's the morning uh-huh. of Gotham too. And he's not, he's not in the cape and cow. It's fine. So, so <laughs> uh, anyway, so of course I mentioned that he's in a bit of a situation, and if if you can, uh, you know, he basically asking so if if you can come to aid him here in, in, uh-huh. in the situation. Of course, he's then taken uh, by some unexpected guests. And oh, that polite he is! It looks like I have some unexpected guests, sir. And of course, you get you hear the the rough the roughness going on as he's being taken. Of course, poor. And this is where my heart goes out to Bruce Wayne. He's like poor Bruce Wayne. He's helping oh, yeah. the phone to help his family member here. He's like, Alfred, Alfred. He's doing that Alfred thing from Eternal Youth. I love it. All right. So Bruce grabs uh grabs Robin, gets in the bat plane or black. Bat jet or whatever you Bat want to wing. call it. Bat wing. Sorry, yeah. Bat wing. I'm sorry. Duh. They're suing up and heading to London. Uh, Batman explains Alfred's background to Robin, which essentially is he was an attache. It means you know intelligence agent. The point being, he was he was a uh, intelligence agent in the in the British. Uh, uh, is it Secret Service or Special Service? I, the point being, the British service. Uh, it was essentially. I think it's it's MI6. I think it's the same thing, if not something remarkably close. Mm-hmm. Um, he did more desk jobs and he did more desk work than field work, but importantly, diffused dip- diplomatic situations, very dangerous diplomatic situations. And again, uh, Alfred, again, he's uh, again he's a smart cookie. He knows he again he was he's negotiation skills, and again he's really crafty in the field. Big thing. Oh yeah. All right. So then we see uh, then we see the car pull up to this big castle dragon in London, and this is like I- I'm loving this setting, man. I really am. Yes, uh, Castle uh, Blair Quan, which is a real place. Yeah, they geographically, yeah. they fudged a few details. So, but yeah, whatever. Being, it yeah, looks cool, dude. I could, exactly. like I could I could care less about the details. That's what it, I'm saying. It's the just a really, is really cool looking dark castle, man. It, it's a perfect villain hideout. Exactly. All right. All right, so uh, we be reunited with Frederick, who, by the way, uh, Roy uh, uh, Dolchries or uh, Dolchries uh, does those performance on uh, on Frederick here, and he was a Mozart in Amadeus. Oh wow! Okay, a little fun fact. You could or not, Dragon. You're you're gonna flip out for this. I still haven't seen Amadeus. Uh, I need to see it. 
I need to see it. I know that, that's make, one that's definitely. Make it sell Yuri Cry, my friend. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, um, anyway, the so point is, Frederick's very apologetic about involving Alfred, and again, also Batman mentioned the previous scene again. Uh, the cousin meant a government agent, by the way. It was like an old, like uh, it's like a means partner, means fellow operative cousin in the in the British uh, Secret Service. So it's kind of anyway. So the point being, uh, he's an old, uh, he's kind of old retiree buddy of, of Alfred's from their spy days, essentially. Uh, they're at Castle Blair Quantum, which is occupied currently by Red Claw. Red Claw. <laughs> by the way, Red Claw, fun fact, because we're going to be talking about this soon, uh, Kate uh, Mulgrew does the voice of Red Claw. I completely forgot about this. Uh, Kate Mulgrew, she's the cat on Infinity Train. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, I can see it. Yeah. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Okay, so anyways, of course, Red Claw basically holding Alfred hostage here, and of course we reveal, oh god, she's been waiting for Alfred. It's not just like a happenstance thing, he's get involved in the wrong business. Like, no, she's, she's looking for Alfred and Frederick. So it's like, do what I say and you'll see tomorrow. It's like, oh god, <laughs> Alfred's in trouble. So, let's see, so Bruce and Dick, they're uh, investigating the signs of a struggle at uh, the Yorkshire Arms. Again, like, out of the costumes here, just, you know, in broad daylight. Little, well, again, it's, like, about to become sun. It's hard to tell in England, folks. I'm sorry. It looks like it's about to... You know it's what? About... It's cool, because it, I totally don't mind, because I anytime know. you see it, it's atmospheric. So, that's exactly. what matters. So it's, it's perfectly... <laughs> I know. Anyways. So, anyway. So they're investigating, looking for, they, they see signs of a struggle. Robin's like, oh, poor Alfred. And of course, uh, Batman here, he's saying, well, he's quite formidable in his day, so I wouldn't be too worried about him here. I, you know, I think he, he probably handled himself good. Alfred, good. Alfred's good in the crisis. So Bert and Ernie then spot them, and they're trying to nab uh, the Bruce and Dick. Uh, of course, they walk down an alley, which you never want to try to sneak up on Batman in an alley. Kids. <laughs> you never. One, he's going to be in a bad mood, because he's always in a bad mood. Right, in an alley. Right. Two, I mean, come on, Batman, you never sneak up. Anyway, so they, they they try to sneak up on them. They, of course, they, they go through the alley. No one's there. Drops down. Batman and Robin suited up. Oh. <laughs> of course, they make their entrance. Then this leads ultimately to a double-decker bus chase, which is pretty cool. It is. I, I, I like this chase. It's like a, a middle-of-the-episode like action set piece, Dragon. It doesn't last long, but it gives us a little shot of adrenaline. You know, it gives Bird and Ernie a cool, memorable thing to do. <laughs> nice. We have some really good bits of Robin here, and again, this whole section of season three we're in now—the whole like adventures of Batman and Robin. Again, we got to give Robin stuff to do, and again, it, this it feels natural because you know it's a it's kind of a buddy adventure to London in a sense. Yeah, 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 totally. And totally. I love like Robin coming in, like, "Hey, can I see your license?" <laughs> it's basically it's kind of Spider-Man esque, actually. It is. So this, this leads to a crash, and then Robin doing his really great acrobatic landing that he prepared for at the start oh, yeah. of the episode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, before, so before they wait, they wait to wake these guys up and interrogate them. Uh, they uh, Robin spots. Uh, we don't need to. We don't need to wait till they wake up as they see the tattoos, the Red Claw tattoo, like Red, Red Claw. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Red Claw, and I think she works a lot better here. Of course, Red Claw works. You know, she's at her core, she's a terrorist. That's her whole shtick. And again, working into a Catwoman episode, it's like, do we really want to mix like a Catwoman episode with a, like, a terrorism theme? I mean, yeah, that was weird. That was weird, and a yeah. two-parter nonetheless. When it didn't really need to be a two-parter, that was that another was the, awful thing about it. Which is the downfall of that episode of that two-parter. And this, of course, a very simple Red Claw. Yeah, just like an original terrorist character for the anime. Right, I will say this: uh, Red Claw definitely. She. There were some moments that were genuinely chilling from her. This episode for me. Again, this episode did her a lot of favors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. So, so, anyways, Red Claw, she interrogates the two of them, or, you know, these two former agents that both hold a, we reveal, uh, they hold, both hold one part of a firing code, of a two-part kind of firing code sequence, mm -hmm. which basically, uh, the, the in, Bla in Castle Blair Quan, or at least around Castle Blair Quan, uh, there is a missile silo, like the last of, like, of, of these missile silos they found access to and they know how to unlock it, and basically they're going to use this missile silo once they have the firing codes, to uh, uh to ransom England uh, for five billion pounds, a lot. <laughs> five billion pounds, uh, and of course our two ardent agents they refuse. You know, they, they're on their honor, and they took oaths for you know for the for the positions, of course. Which of course leads to the reveal of the really ominous injector. Like, oh God, there's going to be some torture in Saturday morning television. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So the point being, Alfred uh, Alfred's going to be put to the ring of this episode, kids. 
So I, I really like this scene. We have, uh, we have, I, I don't know, what would you call them, Dragon? Like prime ministers? Uh, essentially, they are. Uh, yeah, they're they're government ministers and kind of. Yeah, like, they're yeah. in a shadow meeting right now. They're kind of like the men in the poorly lit rooms who secretly control the world. Essentially, yes. <laughs> all right, but anyways, my my point is, it's kind of fun to see uh, Batman get all up in the uh, the UK prime minister business. Yeah, this feels like the most Londinium Larceny's esque thing where Batman's dealing with the government officials of London. That's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is really, I love that like he's kind of he's kind of he's kind of like flying in the face of the snooty protocol here. Whereas there's no time for protocol because like, you that Agent Pennyworth. We're looking for that guy. And of course they're they're asking, like, why should we tell you? And of course Batman just says, Okay, I don't have time for this, where he goes the brass tacks because I can give you red claw. It's like, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> We'll tell, you where, we'll tell you what the castle is. Class, yes, yeah, no, no, no. I, I love this face-off dragon. It's great. There's like this, like uh, you know, this great pan of like them all like zooming in, and then Bat zooms in on Batman's face, his eyes squint, and it's like, all right. <laughs> yeah. You know, she just slides over the file. That, that's a, that's a great moment, dragon. That is a very understated but really good Batman moment. Oh yeah, and it just gets better when he gets, when Batman deals with the government man. It's awesome, <laughs> especially like in Justice League. Trust me, when he, you know when he gets down to like when he deals with Amanda Waller from the Suicide Squad. Oh man, I can imagine. You can. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, so okay, so let's see. So uh, basically, he learns about Blair Kwan and the the, the project the Excalibur dossier. It's kind of what he gets there. And I love that Batman. He uh, as they're about to expose him, what's in that file to him. Batman already has the file. He's not going to stick around. He's, he's got to find Alfred. So, bad, bad exit mid-expo. Awesome. <laughs> Listen, we don't have time to play these these procedurally plot games, man. We got out. We got an Alfred to save. Right. Okay, so, so back to Red Claw. Uh, Red Claw basically says the old methods are still often the best. Uh, fight it if you like. You won't hold out for long. So, essentially, she's uh, she's drugging them with truth serum. Yeah, sodium pentothal, which a little continuity thing. I mean, take it or leave it, if you will. But remember, Alfred was subject. Hugo Strange subjected Alfred to sodium pentothal, and he cracked. And I'm sure Alfred felt really guilty about that. So, I love that Alfred, possibly in response to that, he's uh, upped his resistance to it. My little yeah, idea. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh... Um, Let's see, so we reveal this hidden control panel in the room where basically they're going to enter in the, the missile codes and everything. Alfred promises nothing but gibberish. I like, I really like that as a strategy to uh, to ward it off, though, Dragon. I thought that was really clever. It is, it is. And I love that from Zimbalist Jr. with all those great you know, gibberish quotes and everything. Basically, he's like quoting uh, these passages from, I think it's like, one of them's the brook, and then there's... Uh, the charge of the, the charge of the light brigade. Uh, so, like you know, the disguise of the code. That's really kind of cool. He's quoting some you know, literature. It's kind of neat. So, essentially, what he's doing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Essentially, what he's doing is he's hiding the code in plain sight within the gibberish. He's saying. Essentially, yes. That's pretty much what he's because he knows the line of the unicorn is in reference to one of these old kind of one of these old tales, and basically he's putting a bunch of other tales in there. He's playing a shell game, but also trying to code it in plain sight. Yeah. That's really clever. Point being, he's trying like the hopefully it's just just going to read it as gibberish once he eventually caves and tells her you know the thing. Mm-hmm. So again, smart move on Alfred there. Again, this is what I'm talking about the diplomat, the, the guy who diffused all the diplomatic dangerously situations. Awesome. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, all right. Yes. Okay. So Frederick, unfortunately, he caves. He gives half the half the code, which again he he hasn't he isn't as crafty as Alfred, unfortunately. <laughs> So uh, let's see. So yeah. she's very Red Claw is very confident the serum's going to work. Like she's she's uh, we're rooting for Alfred, aren't we? We're rooting. Oh man, hopefully Alfred won't cave. Hopefully he won't blow up. Uh, you won't blow up. Uh, you know the, the the square. Oh god. <laughs> well, Dragon. I mean, they're seriously high stakes here, man. I mean, I just want to highlight that. Like we are literally like it's Batman against a terrorist attack. Like it is. bar none. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're going Kingsman levels with this Batman episode, folks. Right. Really. Right. <laughs> 
All right, so then we have, oh, this is a great sequence. So now Batman and Robin, they enter Castle Blair Kwan very stealthily, and we have, like, Batman in the water. He's basically, he's basically swimming there, basically kind of calls one of the guys over, and, like, bam, just drags him in the water with him. Robin, he's doing, like, the, some really cool flips and everything uh, as he's taking the guy down. Then, basically, we have this excellent sequence of uh, all these great stealth takedowns of Batman and Robin. Yes, yes, guys. I love the stealth takedowns, Dragon. That's amazing. Oh, I live, oh I my live God. for the sort of stuff with Batman. And Dragon, it's, it's another another moment where it's like this is just another moment in this episode where i'm like why is it this episode talked about i mean i understand that it's not a pantheon episode but it's still like just damn good it's it's just got a, a, you know just a, a series of great moments like this oh yeah so those four guys walking down a corridor and just one by one in the, <laughs> in the background i mean i know it's the first guy in the line just Batman swoops in, goes like from left to right in the darkness. Then Robin, then then Batman again, of course. Like then ultimately, it's <laughs> then they like tap on the shoulder and boom, it's Batman takes him down. We have this great shot of the symbols like Batman. Like he swoops on the guy. We see the bat symbol up close in the camera. It looks great. So let's see. So then Red Claw, she's uh, she's on camera. She's doing the big. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Red Claw sees him on camera. She sees him on camera. So now she knows. Okay, we have a timetable here. Let's step it up a little bit. <laughs> She's baffled by, how did, how did he know about this? Of course, had she known, like, oh, yeah, if I only knew that Bruce Wayne had a butler that also was my, was my prime target, maybe I would have done something. <laughs> but she doesn't know that. So, um, yes, yeah, so let's see. So, all right. Uh, how do you know about this? She sets the alarm. Basically, a whole swarm of guys are coming to deal with Batman and Robin as she goes about her, her kind of true lies business, as it were. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we have this bridge. over. We have a death trap. Not bad. Yeah, a little bit of a death trap, yeah. We have this bridge overlooking some spikes, uh, gargoyles pouring what I think is acid or something, something you don't want to be caught in. So it's like pouring all this acid on, on a bridge. Uh, of course, uh, after 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 it kind of like runs, uh, these two guards come in to check the handwork. Two, one less thing to worry about. Two less things to worry about. Oh, Dennis, you're always a funny one, aren't you? <laughs> so we reveal Batman and Robin very cleverly uh, grappled to the under. To the underside of the bridge to knock him out really cool so now red claw she's making her big terrorist demands uh, broadcast yeah so she's uh, kind of gloating about like oh you may have gone on about having survived plagues fires even the blitz but unless five billion pounds are delivered to me by midnight tonight there will be nothing left to survive and then we show we show the uh, the Blair Kwan Castle, uh, the missile installation, and we have the codes to operate the missile. Uh, we show a shot of the missile that's kind of steaming and warming up. You have one hour; otherwise, I'll be p- forced to plant the warhead in the middle of Trafalgar Trafalgar Tr- Square. Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square. Tr- sorry, Trafalgar Square. Yeah. God save the Queen. Which I want to say, I think I think the Queen lives around there, right? I want to say. I'm pretty sure. I think that's why she's like, God save I'm the I'm not the right place. person to ask, but... <laughs> well, I'm going to say, I think that I'm pretty, like, yeah, Big Ben's there, and I think it's like the main sure, part. Sure, sure. I'm pretty sure, like, though, like, oh, it's... Anyway, the point being, I'm pretty sure it's where the queen is, hence the line. Okay. So, also, a really good thing here, I love we call her out on here, is that Red Claw is bluffing, because she has, doesn't have that second part of the code yet. <laughs> but you know what I like about that, is that she's so convincing in the video that we as an audience kind of buy into it. Oh, yeah. Let's see, so Batman and Robin, they, uh, they bowler wrap some gunmen as they're going up the stairs. A little bit they're continuing to make their way. It's like, again, a little bit of that Hitchcockian it's tension. Like a video game level, Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> so Red Claw. But, no, I'm sorry, you're right. There is definitely a Hitchcockian tension to it as well. Yeah, so basically, they're both on, both our good guys and our bad guys are on a timetable. It's like kind of right, right. mounting tension. But you're right, it's like a video game speak, very Arkham esque, if you will. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that, uh, let's see, Red Claw. Now she's desperately just just slapping poor Alf for just to get just to get him to, to give up the code. So now he's going on. Now he's going on about the lion and the unicorn fighting for the crown. The lion and the of course, like he's just like. Then what? Red Claw kind of gets a light, an evil light bulb moment here. Wait a minute. Lion and the unicorn fighting for the crown. It's impossible because she realized it's impossible for him to res- re- resist this long unless, and again, devastating light bulb moment. That is the code. She puts it in, which means, oh god, now she can launch the missile, which is not good. 
Let's see, Batman. He's uh, he's, he's knocking on the door. Uh, th- oh, this is a great trick. Yeah, oh. this is great. <laughs> the, the, the smoke bombs just come out, and uh, they just emerge from the fog again. Dragon, very video game like, very much taking out waves of bad guys. Yeah, but also, I, mean, I love this trick of he. It's this old. It's this great gag where he basically he knocks on the door, and they open the door, and it's, he uses the knocked out goon to to basically get it get them to open the door, and he tosses right. the. Uh, Toss of the smoke bombs in there for the whole sequence, and the whole sequence does look really great. But again, they they mastered the fog and the smoke for this episode. Well, never, really I did. I'd argue to say they never gotten the smoke effect to look this great uh, up to this point. I mean, I, not that it didn't look good before. I'm just saying you they they had tear gas, they had smoke bombs. That way they animated a little bit differently. I think the way they did it here is really great because you see shadows of things. So you know, it's just like just visual enough, but also anyway, it looks good. So let's see. So the action's really uh, really kicking off now. So. Um, so we have some cool takedowns. Uh, Red Claw, she uh, she starts the countdown, which means they have 60 minutes uh, initially, unless somebody hits the launch button, which we really don't want to happen. I, mean, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, that'd be, that'd be too close to comfort, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and this is what I'm saying, Dragon. Like, from this point forward, I'm just like, oh, shit, it's going down. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, so before Robin is taken out, like he, he finds Alfred, but there's a lady gunman who's about to, to waste Robin. Then Alfred, oh man, Alfred comes. This is what I'm talking about. Alfred, he'll do anything to save these two boys, man. That's what he's going to do. So Alfred, <laughs> he he, uh, he frees himself. And again, a little hitchcock thing, because you see him w- working with the restraints. You'll know if he's going <laughs> to be able to get out. And he does. And the nick of time uh, breaks a Louis a Quinez, like a Louis the Fifteenth chair over top the girl's heads oh louis quinez what a pity that's out <laughs> that's the guy so um breaks it over her head then red claws in uh and he knocks out robin for a spell um i thought you i thought you can only dust furniture says robin before he's knocked out i was gonna get that in there it's problem with whips Okay, so uh, Red Claw then accelerates the launch as Batman is breaking down the door. Uh, Red Claw flees, we think. That's the last we're going to see of Red Claw, right? <laughs> <laughs> this was I, this was like the great reveal, by the way, with that, too. Like, you think Red Claw's out of the episode, and of course, boy, does she come back. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Dragon. We will. <laughs> so, uh, basically, now, now she's hit the button. It's five minutes to detonation, but the thing gets launched is basically five minutes until it's going to make contact. <laughs> And, and Dragon, I'll say, watching this, it was it was pretty surreal. I was just like, oh my god, they literally not launched a nuclear bomb in a Batman show. Like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Dragon, this was my first, like, oh shit moment when, when uh, Batman just runs out of there, fires up the Batwing, mm-hmm. and you know what I'm thinking, Dragon? I'm thinking Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, and again, you're seeing the kind of the point. The, again, we know no one watched the animated series because that John Daggett thing. So I'm just sure. saying, because he's done this one other time in the animated in the JLU. He does this in a in once more, but they got again. They probably got the idea from this episode. From being uh-huh. Batman using the bat wing to take down a you know, take down a bomb. So um, again, I love when he uses when he's running and he's using the the controls and the belt to activate. You know, the the thing. difference between this and the Dark Knight Rises is though, Dragon, is that uh. This, they just make it a lot more clear what's going on. You know what I mean? Sure. All right, anyways, go ahead. So, again, I love when he's always hitting the controls on the belt while he's, you know, <laughs> like summoning the Batmobile and he's summoning the Batwing. That's always really cool. <laughs> also, I love he logically asked for, like, the, the destruct code, which neither of them have, which is not good. So then that's when Batman's springing that. She's got five minutes to save Trafalgar Square. <laughs> it's not <laughs> even his city and he's going to save Trafalgar Square because Batman's awesome. <laughs> so... Okay, so anyway, so he's um, he's getting the bat wing. The idea is going to shoot it down uh, with you know the bat, uh, the you know, the anti ordnance thing. The bat it's on the bat wing um, to shoot it down. Uh, of course, right as he's lining up the shot, kind of you know almost like Star Wars targeting computer cells. So as he lines up the shot, Red Claw was in the bat wing. Oh God! Hey, Dragon, you, you can imagine this was another one of my oh shit reactions. There's the big Hitchcockian moment here again. The time is of the essence, and then oh God, it's Red Claw. Uh, Dragon, would you wager to say that this might be a matchstick moment, if you yes, will? Yes, it is a matchstick right. moment, All right. sir. <laughs> so, uh, so, Red Claw, she it's is... It's an she's, intense, awesome matchstick moment. It is, it is. Red Claw, she's in the uh, the passenger seat, unbeknownst to Batman. Right as he's about the, the fire thing, like, she's, they strangle him from the back. Uh, she's, there's a struggle uh, from behind. Even, this is the big shock and all this, is the only time this has ever really happened in uh, the animated series. Uh, Batman um, unmasked by a villain. 
Oh yeah, right. Joker right. tried once. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't do it. He didn't pull the thing off. He was starting to, but my God, Red Claw, she this is the big moment. They already completely unmasked him. Huge moment. Uh, it just adds more and more tension to what's going. On. Oh God, man, she's unmasked. Him. What is going on? <laughs> so Batman, he then flies close to the water because again, Batman has a plan. He hits the ejector seat before she can get a uh, before she can get a good look at him and everything. And also again, because he's got a missile to deal with, ejects her uh, from the back. Uh, she lands in the water. We never see her again, so, you know, it's unclear. Oh, God. <laughs> I think, I'm pretty sure she's alive, because, I mean, again, terrorist galore, I, I'm sure she can swim. I'm sure, sure. sure. <laughs> so, anyway, so, um, anyway, so after he flies, goes to the water, he ejects her. He, he then uh, he goes to the missile, he, he hits the missile uh, right right the last second, right before it hits Big Ben. Right before it hit Big Ben. That's an iconic shot, Dragon. I, I Man, I mean... I don't know. I, I, I keep on saying it, but this episode needs more love. I mean, that was literally like right down to the wire. I mean, you can't ask for better suspense. And he, we see the bat wing, like of course, very much in the bat symbol shape, fly through the the, the plume of smoke from the bomb he just detonated to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So then we have our little airport epilogue. Yeah. So. uh... <laughs> So Frederick's like, I don't suppose you'd consider coming out of retirement and taking up civil, and uh, Alfred's like, and taking up civil service pay grades again? Hardly, old man. I become accustomed to my style of living. It's a pity. It was just like old times. Like, best, mm -hmm. best, best to Whitehall. Of course, he's basically saying best to our superiors and best of the job. And mm -hmm. so, but again, so sweet. Like Alfred just saying it once for the perks, and maybe I'm not cut out for the for the field work necessarily. But it's also him saying, I I, I like hanging out at Gotham. I love hanging out with you know, Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. The whole, you know, the whole, I love my little niche. There. It's nice to see Alfred like you know go home and happy to do so. You know, it's really it's really a great way to end the episode. Sure. All right. Final thoughts, Dragon. Final thoughts. Uh, there's an ambitious quality to, uh, to season three. It's an ambitious move to give Alfred an episode, uh, which again I, I was I was thrilled by. It's a really nice showcase and appropriate use of Red Claw. Um, again, it kind of helps, uh, you know, kind of helps uh, kind of pave the way for the future takes on Alfred in his past, as I said, you know, copiously before. Uh, and again, this episode, as I said, it really gets lost in the shuffle uh, because of, you know, the forgotten Alfred in the Batwing, the forgotten as cool as that is. I know it's the first time it happened, but again, we literally gave Alfred a whole episode. Let's show him some love, man. Let's show the episode it's due. I mean, that little bit of that, also a little bit of rises in there. A little, little fingerprints galore, I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, final thoughts on my end. I think this was a terrific find, Dragon. It really is kind of a diamond in the rough, if you will. It's, uh, I was not, I wasn't really expecting much of anything with this episode beyond just like, oh, look, some fun Alfred shenanigans. But, uh, really, like, I mean, like I said, it's not the deepest episode in the world. It's just like a terrorist demanding an absurd amount of money or else she's going to blow something up. But, I mean, on that basis, it's just, it's very Hitchcockian, um, the suspense is just really palatable, and I, I I think it's a shame that it gets lost in the shuffle. And of course, we've got some great shots with Batman taking down bad guys, and uh, you know, Red Claw is easily way better here than she was in her last appearance. Uh, yeah, just just overall, I feel like this episode uh, really needs more love, man. I, I really think it's a uh, it, it's a shame that it's gotten lost in the shuffle the way it has. Certainly. All right, what's up next, Dragon? An adventure in the Old West. Batman with a book on tape. A special guest star from the DCU. Can Batman unravel this frontier mystery when he's barely in the episode? Mm -hmm. Will this be a bounty hunter's last ride? Tune in next time to find out. Same animated bat time, same animated bat place. On the next visit to the animated bat cave with Showdown. God save the queen.